Hello and welcome to our event. We are happy to have you with us today. My name is Stella Nicolaou and I'm the coordinator of the Human Biology Program at the University of Nicosia. I would like to welcome you all to the third activity of the free online info session, Connect with the Life and Health Sciences. These activities are organized by the Department of Life and Health Sciences and I would like for us to start with a brief welcome from the head of our department, Dr. Kiriakos Felekis. Thank you, Dr. Felakis. So this third activity is organized by the Faculty of the Human Biology Program and is titled The Evolution of Life from Viruses to Humans. Our discipline is hands-on by nature and our graduates are either pursuing graduate or medical studies or are employed in research or clinical labs. So under different circumstances, we would have invited you to our university for an interactive workshop in one of our labs. These photos were taken from a workshop, a similar workshop that was organized about a year ago. I would like for you to imagine that you're one of these participants and we're conducting this workshop in the lab and we are together and discussing the evolution of life, a current issue that affects all of us. This webinar comprises of two presentations. The first one is titled, What Does Evolution Have to Do with Viruses? and will be delivered by Dr. Vicky Nicolaidou. The second one is titled Meet Our Ancestors and it will be delivered by Dr. Iris Haralambidou. We will complete this session with a Q&A session at the very end. So please feel free to write any questions in the chat section of uh, this link and we will address, address them at the very end. Uh, Dr. Nicolaidou, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nicolau. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Vigi Nicolaidou, and I'm faculty teaching at the Human Biology Program of the University of Nicosia. Uh, I am an immunologist, uh, and I teach an immunology course, but I also teach a microbiology and virology course. So uh, taking inspiration from the current events, I would like to spend a few minutes to tell you a little bit about viruses similar to what I do in class with my students. So you've probably seen this uh, picture many times on the news. Uh, it's a representation of the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, a picture that is very poignant and may have caused some nightmares to some of us. Uh, and precisely because of the current events, I wanted to spend a few minutes to talk to you about viruses uh, and you might be wondering, what could evolution have to do with viruses? Because indeed evolution is our topic for this session today. Uh, and I hope that after the few minutes that I will have talked to you, you, uh, you will have realized that ev viruses have a lot to do with evolution. Um, evolution is the change of the characteristics of uh, organisms through the generations. These changes are guided by abiotic and biotic factors, such as the environment, temperature, climate, competition with other uh, species, or even with pathogens. Uh, this interaction is continuous. It's a constant struggle for survival, if you will, uh, which is ultimately the goal of all living organisms. Now, of course, viruses are not considered to be living, or at least not all scientists agree on that. But in any case, uh, as with all living organisms, the same applies for viruses. Survival is their uh, goal. Often when we hear about evolution, we think of the evolution of the human species 
and the populations through millions of years, something that seems difficult to perceive, at least with a superficial observation. But what we are seeing is a, a set of characteristics changing, and each of these characteristics is controlled by genes that can change very rapidly. So it can be said, therefore, that evolution works at the level of the gene. And evolution can happen very quickly in entities that are simple, such as viruses that are made up of far fewer genes. Uh, this allows them to change very quickly with very interesting but sometimes dangerous consequences. The virus that is currently uh, in the spotlight is SARS-CoV-2, which is a coronavirus. Uh, it belongs to a family called Coronaviridae. This is a family that includes many other viruses, about 47 different species. And coronaviruses owe their name uh, uh, by how they look under the microscope. If you look uh, using an electronic microscope, uh, you will see that they look like uh, they resemble a crown. So they have these things surrounding them like a crown. That's why they were called coronaviruses. Uh, they are spherical particles with a diameter of about 100 to 160 nanometers. So to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about here, nano, nano is uh, 10 to the power of minus 9. So just to give you an idea how small that is, uh, consider a viral particle or a virion, a balloon, and planet Earth. So the viral particle of the herpes simplex virus which is about 150 to 241 nanometers, so slightly bigger than the coronavirus, is as many times smaller than a balloon as a balloon is smaller than planet Earth. So we're talking about something very, very small indeed. The virus particle, similar to the one I'm showing you here, this is a representation of the virion, the virus particle of the HIV virus, um, uh, but it has many similarities, so I'm showing you what it consists of. The virus co a particle consists of several parts, including the envelope, which is this blue part around here. Uh, its consistency is like the membranes of our cells. Its composition is like the membranes of our cells. And inside, we have the protein capsid, so it's a capsid made of protein. So these red uh, subunits represent proteins. And inside, we have the genome, what you see here in yellow. So the capsid encases pro and protects the genome. And the capsid is found encased by this envelope. So in addition to encasing the capsid, the envelope also contains viral proteins, uh, such as the S or spike protein, the E envelope, and M membrane protein. So uh, this is a representation of the spike protein. And this is the uh, protein that the virus use to uses to attach to the cell receptor on our, no on our own cells, similar to how a key fits into a lock to open a door. And that's, why the, that's how the virus can uh, enter our own cells and infect them. Uh, the, uh, Coronavirus also has the nucleoprotein N that is bound to the genome. Uh, and the genome of the coronaviruses is made of RNA. It's a single-stranded positive polarity RNA molecule. And together with that, there is also a viral RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme that the virus uses to replicate its, GNA, its RNA genome so that each new viral particle that is produced can have its own copy of the genome. Um, these enzymes, interestingly, can make mistakes during this copying process. So this is one of the ways how these viruses can evolve very quickly. So what about coronaviruses now as a group of viruses? Uh, they are viruses that are found in many animals and humans, and they are further classified into alpha coronaviruses and beta coronaviruses. Alpha coronaviruses such as human coronavirus 229E or NL63, these are examples of alpha coronaviruses, uh, human alpha coronaviruses, and examples of human beta coronaviruses, HKU1 or OC43. So in humans, these viruses usually cause 
mild to moderate upper respiratory tract infection with symptoms very similar to those of the common cold, a runny nose, cough, sore throat, headache, and fever. These viruses are responsible for about 30% of respiratory infections each year, uh, each winter, and in people, however, with weakened immune systems or underlying diseases, they can cause more serious uh, disease, uh, more serious infection in the lower respiratory tract, such as bronchitis or pneumonia, uh, kidney failure, or even death. Uh, but there are also the zoonotic viruses that belong to this group. Um, and interestingly, all the zoonotic coronaviruses belong to the beta coronaviruses. What, this, what does zoonotic mean? So zoonotic uh, are viruses that can be passed on from, human, from animals to humans. Uh, so they are usually new viruses that are emerging. They are evolving. They are changing to acquire the ability to uh, spread to humans. Uh, we just give them the opportunity, we humans just give them the opportunity to do that but by coming into contact with wild animals or with the habitats that uh, they, um, uh, they live. And indeed, this is what happened in uh, 2002, 2004. I'm sorry, I have to stop for a second. I'm sorry for that interruption. So indeed, this is what happened in 2002, 2004, when we had the outbreak of SARS-CoV-1, uh, SARS uh, and indeed this caused a pandemic. And the same happened in 2012 with the outbreak caused by the MERS coronavirus. These viruses, SARS-CoV and MERS, um, uh, are responsible for more serious respiratory diseases as, as compared to uh, these uh, other human coronaviruses and can lead to death with a mortality rate of about 9.5% uh, for SARS-CoV in the outbreak of 2002-2004 and about 34.5% for MERS uh, coronavirus outbreak that occurred in 2012. But what about the new SARS coronavirus, SARS CoV 2? This belongs to also to the Beta coronavirus group. And uh, uh, based on the genetic makeup of the new virus that was announced by the Chinese health authorities, the virus has uh, a 75 to 80 percent uh, similarity, genetic similarity to SARS CoV, and more than 85 percent genetic similarity two coronaviruses that infect bats. Uh, the finding of this genetic sequence of the new coronavirus was very important because it allowed the classification and monomenclature of this new virus by the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, or ICTV, which is the body that is officially responsible for uh, classifying and naming viruses. Uh, as you can see here in this phylogenetic tree that represents the genetic similarity, the evolutionary similarity with other viruses, uh, indeed you see that the closer they are together, the more uh, uh, similar they are. So that you see that this new virus is very similar to SARS-CoV and to these uh, coronaviruses that circulate in bats. So identifying the genetic makeup of this new virus was not only important for nomenclature and classification, but importantly, because it allowed biologists to develop the specific tests that are based on real-time PCR techniques uh, that allow for the specific detection of this new virus in the samples and this molecular test that you hear all the time on TV, this is exactly what we are able to do. And this is especially important considering that in addition to the novel coronavirus, other coronaviruses are circulating and infecting the human population, especially during the winter months. So therefore, the specificity of the detection is very important to allow the new virus to be separated from other usual human coronaviruses that may be circulating in the population and therefore prevent false alarms. 
Um, the new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, received its official name by the ICTV, as I said. Uh, it causes a respiratory infection of varying severity, and the disease was officially named as COVID-19 by the WHO. The respiratory infection with SARS-CoV-2, as mentioned above, has a severity that varies with the majority of infected people having no or mild symptoms. Symptoms usually appear two to five days, but they might be as late as 14 days after the exposure to the virus and are escalating. And they include headache, runny nose, cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. It is estimated that 15 to 20% of those infected will need treatment. There is also a small percentage who will get more seriously ill and they may need to be treated in intensive care units with the use of respirators. The mortality of the new coronavirus is estimated at about 5%, but we still cannot say for sure. This is very much an ongoing situation. It is, however, definitely lower than the mortality rate that we saw previously with SARS-CoV and MERS coronaviruses. It should also be mentioned that the virus is transmitted through the air by an infected person via droplets that are produced during coughing or sneezing, or when these droplets fall on surfaces and the surfaces become infected, then we touch them and we put our hands in contact with our mouth, our nose, our eyes, and in this way, introducing the virus into our own body. Finally, even though you probably have heard of many trials for potential treatments, some with worse and some with better outcomes, there is currently no specific antiviral treatment. So it is mainly a treatment that is based, based on treating the symptoms. You might also have heard of intensive efforts of scientists to find an effective vaccine, something that is very important indeed if we want to achieve protection in the population. But evolution comes back to Jesus and cause problems. Uh, something that can cause problems in our efforts to find an effective vaccine is indeed how quickly these viruses can change. And this is because this change allows the viruses to always be one step ahead of our immune system that is trying to detect and neutralize them. So these viruses are constantly evolving. That means that if we have a vaccine that can induce the immune system to respond against the virus, if the virus suddenly changes, the protective response the vaccine is inducing might be rendered useless. As I told you earlier, viruses can change and evolve very quickly, especially those with this RNA genome. These changes are random and they are not necessarily always beneficial for the virus. For example, if the surface protein, this S, this spike protein uh, that the virus uses to enter our own cells, if this protein changes too much and the virus is no longer able to attach to our own cells, then it cannot infect them. Or if anything else that the virus uses needs to complete its replication cycle changes too much, then it can no longer function properly, then the virus cannot complete its replication cycle. It cannot make copies of itself. On the other hand, other changes may not affect the virus, but they may affect the ability of our immune system to detect it and destroy it. So this is why we need a new vaccine against the flu virus every year, because similar to what we described just now, the flu virus is also constantly changing. And so the protection or immunity that was established within the population the previous year is no longer able to protect us. What remains to be seen is whether the same will apply for SARS-CoV-2, but we will find out soon. So at this point, I would like to conclude this short presentation. I hope you found it interesting and you found that evolution has a lot to do with viruses. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the live chat and we will answer them all together in the end. But at this point, I would like to invite my colleague, Dr. Rizhar Lambide, to take the floor and continue with her, uh, with her part of the presentation. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Vicky, for uh, introducing me, and thank you for that very interesting presentation. And while I show you my presentation, we will see that there is some overlap. There are some similarities with the presentation of Dr. Vicky. So my name is Iris Kerlambidu. I'm a biologist and an ecologist, and I also teach on the Bachelor in Human Biology uh, at the University of Nicosia. And one of the lectures that I teach, one of the courses that I teach is human evolution. And so I'm going to show you some of the subjects that we cover with the students that have to do with the, uh, the evolution of us. So now we have leapt from, we are leaping from viruses to humans in terms of evolution. Okay, I'm going to actually be showing you, asking you some questions but because I cannot see whether there are any answers in the chat, uh, I cannot see that on my screen. I will leave a few seconds after answering the, uh, after asking you the question to give you a chance to think about it. And then I will move on to the next slide. Excuse me. Okay, so my question is, my first question is, what type of organism are humans? And if you see here, if you think about it, we see that humans have a digestive system, they have a circulatory system, they have a nervous system, okay? So basically humans are members of the animal kingdom because we share those characteristics with animals, okay? And in the within the animal kingdom, we belong to the group which are called mammals and if you look at here I have a poster for you and in this poster shows you the different uh, categories of mammals that um, well in the different groups that mammals are divided into for and for example here we have for example marsupials and uh, some characteristic species that most of you probably have seen in documentaries are kangaroos and koalas here we have another very well-known group, which includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Here up here we have carnivores, we have rodents, okay? And I'd like to see if you've noticed where, so if you notice carefully, humans are over here, and we are members of this group of mammals, okay, which are called primates. So I would like to show you a picture with some primates. Excuse me about this for this. Okay, primates. Here are a few primates just to give you an idea. Yeah, is, you, you recognize the lemurs. These are the species of lemurs that are usually shown in most documentaries that that show these uh, this group of animals. Chimpanzee, gorilla, different species of monkeys. So these are just a few of the primates that exist. I think, excuse me a minute, I think I will have to show you the slides like this because it's not working. Okay, so the next question is, what is the scientific name of our species? So our species, our scientific name is Homo sapiens. What does this name mean? Okay, Homo means human and sapiens means wise. So Homo sapiens means the wise human. Okay, I'd like you to notice, I said that this, the, this is the genus Homo and it means human. And within this genus, actually, there are at least 10 or 11 species of humans belong to this group. However, all of the other human species have gone extinct. The only human species that still exists nowadays is our species. Here are a couple of examples of the other human species that are extinct now. One of these, I chose two species which are actually very well known. One of them is the Homo neanderthalensis, the, the Neanderthal, and the other one is called upright standing human, so it's Homo erectus. 
Okay, and these are actually two of the, the most well-known uh, extinct human species that have existed. So, the next question is, do other animals have scientific names? And the answer is that all living organisms have a scientific name, not only animals. And if you remember in the presentation by Dr. Vicky Nicol uh, Nicolaido, she actually showed you, she discussed with you about how the coronavirus uh, was given its name. So I have an example here of animals. So the cat, the scientific name of the cat, the scientific name of the dog. Also, the scientific name of the apple to show you that plants, all, all plants have scientific that causes tuberculosis. Its scientific name is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, uh, and as Dr. Vicky showed you earlier, viruses also have names. The scientific name of the virus that cause, causes the disease Ebola is called Zaire Ebola virus. Okay, so it's important to realize that all species have a scientific name. And uh, in this slide, I'm showing you the evolutionary relationship. It's a very general scheme between the different groups of primates. And if you remember, Dr. Vicky also showed you a similar picture which was on its side and that showed you an evo the evolutionary relationship between different species of viruses okay when you look at this picture you have to look the y-axis has to do with years so if you go back in time this is now going back to about 45 million years ago here on the x-axis we have the different Grow, uh, categories of primates. So, for example, the prosimians include the lemurs. I showed you a picture of a lemur earlier. Then we have monkeys over here. Then we have the apes over here. And over here we have the humans. And when you look at this uh, diagram, it actually helps you to understand what is the evolutionary relationship between the, these different uh, groups of primates. And for example, we can understand if we go to 45 million years in the past, we can see that all primates had a common ancestor. If we would like to see which is the closest primate, which is the closest species to us, we go over here to humans and we go back in time, okay? And we stop here and we see that we had our most common um ancestor in terms of evolution was actually if we go further back in time so going backwards we see that in this in this point in time the gorilla chimpanzees and humans had a common ancestor this is about 10 million years ago if we go even further back in time we see that there was a common ancestor between all of us here and the orangutans so if you when you look at this uh, this diagram you can understand how closely or how um how distant uh, are the relations between different groups of, of primates so our closest living relatives now are the chimpanzees so in the next slide i'm going to show you this this bit of the diagram over here So this diagram, actually, what it shows you, it shows you that six to eight million years ago, over here, there was a common ancestor between um, chimpanzees and between humans. So at this point in time, there was a species that started most in east africa started evolving in a certain direction gave different species that eventually evolved into uh, chimpanzees and on along this evolutionary line this common ancestor started evolving in a different way and many different species along this line eventually evolved one of the species evolved into humans into homo sapiens 
Okay, and because, uh, as I said earlier, all other human species have gone extinct, and the other human species were around about here, and before those, there were um, ancestral species to those human species. Okay, all of these are extinct now. And so our closest living relatives in the animal kingdom are chimpanzees. So for this reason, many scientists study chimpanzees because what they want to see what are the similarities and what are the differences between us and chimpanzees. And I'd like you to take a few seconds to try to think what types of uh, issues would these scientists study? How will they figure out what our similarities and what our differences are? Okay, one, one characteristic that can be investigated, for example, is comparing our skulls. So if you compare these two skulls, one of the most uh, char characteristic differences is, if you look at this, is the size of the brain. So the size of the brain of a homo sapiens, I hope everyone realized that this skull on the right is that of a homo sapiens. Uh, the brain size is three to four times larger than the brain size of a chimpanzee, if you notice. Also, if you notice, the jaw of the homo sapiens is much more delicate and much smaller than that of a chimpanzee. The, the face of the chimpanzee protrudes, and also the chimpanzee has much larger teeth, much, lar much larger front teeth, and much larger canines compared to the homo sapiens. There are various other differences as well. I just pointed these out because later when I show you some of our earlier ancestors, they have many similarities with the chimpanzee, some of our earliest ancestors. So another um, topic that is actually compared between humans and chimpanzees is the behavior of chimpanzees. I don't know if any of you are aware or if you have ever heard of this very famous anthropologist. Her name is Jane Goodall. She lived in Tanzania for 30 years. She went there as a young woman in her 20s. And basically she studied the behavior of chimpanzees and she made many amazing discoveries about their behavior. She found many similarities with humans, with the behavior of humans. And uh, Jane Goodall, Dr. Jane Goodall actually, is still, she's in her 80s now, she's still a very active scientist. And um, now she, she visits universities around the world and she gives talks. And she also tries to raise awareness about the impact of human activities on the environment. And so in the next slide, I would like to show you an interview that she had uh, in April, uh, where she discusses the, the relationship between the trafficking of wildlife and COVID-19. And also Dr. Vicky Nicolaido also mentioned something about that earlier when she talked about um, the link between wildlife and humans. So I'll let you listen to her interview just for one minute. We've been responsible for this. We have to treat nature better. Wildlife trafficking, which we're combating all over the world, is for one thing bringing people and animals in closer contact so that there's more opportunity for viruses to jump from animals to humans crossing the species barrier. And this is particularly so in the, the meat markets, the wet markets of China, the bush meat that's eaten in Africa and other parts of Asia. And the hunting in Europe and the United States as well. So definitely the wildlife trafficking, the movement of animals around the world is something that's very important. We've been... Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. If you actually go online, you will notice that uh, Dr. Jane Gordall has had many more interviews since that last one in April. 
and she actually says lots of interesting things about COVID-19, but also many interesting things about what issues she believes young people should be interested in dealing with in today's world. So, okay, I've come back. If you notice, I've come back to the previous uh, diagram that I showed you earlier, which showed us the evolutionary split between chimpanzees and humans, homo sapiens. And if you notice over here now on the right hand side, which is the evolutionary line that eventually led to Homo sapiens, you see that, okay, these are not the only species that existed along this line. These are the main groups of species that existed. And I would like to ask you, how do you think, how do you believe scientists know that these species existed? How do we know this, all this information? How do we know, for example, that a group this is called the Artipithecus group. How do we know that this species uh, was around um, about six to seven million years ago? How do we know that then they evolved into this group, which are called the Australopithecus group? And uh, that then this group evolved into the Homo group, which eventually uh, one of those species evolved into Homo sapiens. How do we know all this information? So one of the sources of information is actually fossils. And uh, for example, all these, these pictures that I show you are examples of different skulls that have been found. And these are skulls uh, the, of species that belong to the evolutionary line that led to Homo sapiens. They do not belong to another line of evolution. So I'd like to see if you notice where the Homo sapiens is. The Homo sapiens is over here. And I'd like you to notice the first species along the line. If you notice, the skulls look more like the skull of the chimpanzee I showed you earlier. So with a smaller brain compared over here to the Homo sapiens and the other extinct human species, you can also see they have much larger brains than these species up here. Okay, so the scientists can actually find a lot of information when they look at skulls and they can understand uh, many of the different steps in evolution, which eventually led to Homo sapiens. Also, very interestingly, when the scientists have these skulls, they can actually use techniques that are used in modern criminology or in forensic science and they can actually uh, reconstruct the face to see what the species looked like. Okay, this is actually not a Homo sapiens over here. Uh, I found in some sources that it's either a Homo erectus or a Homo hedalbigensis. So other human species that have become extinct. So basically this is a reconstruction of the face of another human species using technology that we also use in modern forensic science. Also, interestingly, scientists can also use this technology for earlier skulls as well. Or if you remember, I told you there was an earlier group called Australopithecus, and they can use this technology to reconstruct the face of an Australopithecus, which is what you see over here. So this is another very interesting technique that scientists can use to find out about the past and about our ancestors. So uh, I'm actually going to show you a video that was created by a paleontologist who is also a paleoartist. He used various skulls, like the ones that I showed you two slides earlier, and he tried to reconstruct what the faces of the different ancestral species looked like. And I would like you to notice that the first faces look more like the face of an ape. And I'd like you to notice how the characteristics change, how the cheekbones change, how the shape of the nose changes, uh, how the face gradually becomes flatter. And eventually, after a few seconds, you will notice that the species look more human-like and then eventually we will see three or four human species and then you will see homo sapiens the homo sapiens that you will see is actually the face of the artist who created this video i will let you watch it now
Okay, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to show this was because many people understand how our ans uh, the ancest an ancestral species that looked like an ape eventually evolved into Homo sapiens. And I wanted to show you that all this, this ev evolution that you saw, it was only 19 sec a 90 second video, but it covered the span of between six to eight years, uh, six to eight million years of evolution since our evolutionary line split with the evolutionary line of chimpanzees. Okay, another uh, very interesting source of information are some fossilized footprints, uh, these over here, that were discovered in Tanzania. And these footprints were dated to about 3.6 million years old. And if you notice, if you look at them like this, if you imagine yourselves walking, for example, on the beach in the sand, you could imagine that this is one step, another step, another one, and another one. Okay, and if you notice next to it on the left, can you see that there are here much smaller footsteps? So you can see a younger individual walking next to a, 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 an older one. And you can understand from the footsteps that you are looking at a species that's walking on two legs. 3.6 million years ago. So one of the questions that I ask my students when I show them this slide is, were these footprints made by an ape? And I want you to notice how is the ape walking? Apes walk with their knuckles on the ground. So they are knuckle grazers. They don't walk long distances on two legs. And if you look at this as well, this is a comparison of the foot of a Homo sapiens with the foot of a chimpanzee. And if you notice, the chimpanzee hasn't, doesn't have a toe that's next to the other toes. And also the chimpanzee's foot can be used to actually grasp objects similarly to, to their hands. If you look at these footprints, which has been, have been enlarged over here and over here, it's obvious that this is not the foot of an ape. This is the foot of a species that has many, its footprint has many similarities with the footprint of a Homo sapiens. So this is the, these are the footprints of a species that could walk on two legs, similarly to humans. So this is a major difference with apes. Okay, and the scientists, uh, suggest that the most probable candidate for making these footprints is this species, which is an Australopithecus species that was around uh, three and a half million years ago. And I also wanted you to notice in this picture how small this species is, very small. So it's actually bod the body size of an ape. The brain size was also the brain size of an ape but it had the human characteristic in that it was walking on two legs. If you saw this species among us, you would feel that basically that you're looking at an ape, but with the human characteristics. Uh, we call this type of walking, we call it bipedal locomotion, walking on two legs. So another source of information for scientists is by comparing uh, fossil skeletons, so whole skeletons, not just the skulls. This skeleton over here is the skeleton of this species, this Australopithecus species. This is a skeleton of a Homo sapiens. And if you notice, this is also an Australopithecus, this is another Australopithecus species. So externally, they looked, their, their faces looked like the face of an A, but you can see from the skeletons that they were also walking on two legs, like a human. So the scientists can actually make many comparisons between the anatomy of these different species. And I'm going to show you another video now where actually, I'll just show you the first picture here. The scientists, compare the skeleton of the Australopithecus that made those footprints in Tanzania with the skeleton of a chimpanzee. So they show what are the similarities between a chimpanzee and Australopithecus. 
And then later on, you will see a Homo sapiens over here, and they, they compare the skeleton of the Australopithecus with the Homo sapiens, so with the human. So I would like you to, uh, the reason I'm showing you this is so that you can realize that, understand that this is actually an in-between stage between an ape and the Homo sapiens. So I will let you watch this. There is not any music. You just have to notice which points are being, which parts of the skeleton are being pointed out or mentioned in the video. So I hope that you found the video interesting and that you realize that actually the Australopithecus shared some characteristics with uh, the chimpanzee, with an ape, and some characteristics with the Homo sapiens. Uh, to sum up, what we've sh I've shown you so far is that scientists use fossil evidence. They can look at the skull and the different characteristics of the skull. They can look at skeletons. They can use modern technology to reconstruct the face of ancient species. They can actually use computers to figure out how the different species used to walk based on their anatomy. And also, thanks to modern science, some of our ancestral species, for the most recent ones, scientists could also do DNA analysis. So, for example, in relation to Neanderthal fossils, scientists managed to find, to extract DNA from many specimens of uh, Neanderthals. And for example, in a study that it's called the Neanderthal Genome Project, which was a very big project, the, its aim was to decode, to sequence the Neanderthal genome. The scientists collected DNA from fossils from uh, sites in Russia, Croatia, Germany, Spain, and analyzed these so that they could uh, sequence the full genome of Neanderthals. And what did they find? They actually found that Neanderthals, the Neanderthals are over here, by the way, interbred with the Homo sapiens on many occasions. So they actually found that they realized when they found, uh, they decoded the genome of the Neanderthals, they actually realized that modern humans, Homo sapiens, have some DNA that we inherited from the Neanderthals because of this interbreeding that was taking place. And how did this happen? It happened because the Homo sapiens first appeared in Africa. So we are actually an African species. 
And when the Homo sapiens started, this is Africa, when the Homo sapiens started leaving Africa uh, overland, not over sea, by the way, and though, uh, this was 100,000 years ago, so there, there were no boats in those days. So they were moving everywhere on foot. When they came there, when the Homo sapiens arrived in the Middle East and in Europe and in different parts of Asia, they came across the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals basically lived in Europe and the Middle East. So when the Homo sapiens came across the Neanderthals, there was a lot of uh, interbreeding going on. So basically they had babies together. And so the scientists found in their research that the modern humans, so Homo sapiens, but not Homo sapiens who originate from Africa, non-African Homo sapiens, have one to four percent of our DNA is uh, we inherited from the Neanderthals. We say non-African modern humans because if we go back to this slide, uh, when the Homo sapiens left Africa, of course, there was a population of Homo sapiens who remained in Africa. So the Homo sapiens who remained in Africa never came across the Neanderthals. So it's only the Homo sapiens who ended up in the Middle East, Europe, Asia, who came across the Neanderthals. And that's why in modern humans, um, most of the world uh, have an we have inherited Neanderthal DNA apart from humans who remained in Africa. And actually people from the Middle East usually have a high, sometimes four and a half percent of Neanderthal DNA compared to humans who are from, let's say, other European countries or some parts of Asia. So this was a very interesting find of the scientists. The scientists also within the last uh, five, six years have also realized that Homo sapiens interbred with another, yet another human species that has gone extinct. So but then I don't want to go into too much detail, just so that you realize that we did not only interbreed with the Neanderthals, but also with another human species called the Denisovans. So basically the scientists can use lots of information from many different sources in, in order to find out what happened in the past and to understand who are our ancestors. So um, the main, one of the main messages to come out of this is to understand that there were many ancestral species to us. So this is a Homo sapiens. Look at how many other species existed. These are Homo species over here the homo group that I told you, which is the human group. And these are Australopithecus species. And this slide does not actually show all the species that have been discovered. It would have been far too crowded. So this is just a selection of ancestral species shown on this slide. And it's also important to realize that more species are continuously being discovered. And based on everything that you've seen so far, I'd like you to have a look at this picture. If you, when people, when you type the word evolution in Google, usually this is one of the first pictures that comes up. However, after the information that you've seen today, I hope that you realize that there are some mistakes in this picture. One of the mistakes is the fact that there is um, a misunderstanding a misconception that we have evolved from chimpanzees. We have not evolved from chimpanzees. We share a common common ancestry with chimpanzees. We had a common ancestor six to eight million years ago. So that's one misconception that is, um, that's the answer to the one misconception. And another one is that there is the idea that let's say one species evolved into another one and that it was just one species evolving into another eventually led to Homo sapiens, um, giving the idea that there is a direction in evolution. However, if you look at this picture, this is a much more correct depiction of what human evolution has looked like. So here we have the Homo sapiens. The Homo sapiens coexisted with some other human species that became extinct eventually. 
And before these species, there were many other species going far back into time over the previous six to eight million years. So there were many different species. Not all of them are on our direct lineage, only some of them are. So actually human evolution is a very interesting subject. And as I said before, uh, there are many interesting new discoveries. There's lots of things that can be discussed in relation to this topic. This is just a very brief uh, overview to this subject. So I would like to end it here and to mention that if you would like more information about the university, uh, we have the details of the student admissions office here. So the emails and telephone numbers. If you would like more information about the BS in Human Biology, you may contact Dr. Stella Nicolau, who is the program coordinator. And if you would like more information about this workshop, you may contact myself and Dr. Vicky Nicolaidou. So I would like to thank you for your attention and to invite my colleagues to answer, uh, to see if you have any questions that you would like to discuss. Thank you. Irismo, thank you very much for your contribution. It was very interesting. From what I can see in the live chat, we don't have any uh, questions that are live, but okay. uh, since this uh, video will be on YouTube. We can share it and I hope other people will have the opportunity to see it um, later on. Uh, and um, uh, obviously the information that is shown here uh, it's very useful. Uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions about the program or us individually or about anything that we discussed during this session. I want to pass the floor to the program coordinator, Stella Nicola, for the final conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, many thanks, first of all, to Dr. Nicolae Don Haralambidu for a very interesting and very informative presentations. Thank you for staying with us. I, I realized there were some connection issues in the beginning, but some of you managed to find the correct links. So thank you for staying with us. In case you were unable to watch us live, feel free to contact us via email with any questions about the workshop or the program at, at any point later on. Also, feel free to visit us and ask your questions live if you have the ability to do so. Uh, I will close this session here and I'm going to wish you all a lovely rest of the day.